Okay, here we are. Pastor Kelly is taking a well-deserved night off, and we just want to uh, tonight uh, go to the Word of God and, and take a look at a couple things here. And <clears throat> the uh, situation uh, that we have, uh, there's, a, there's a book that's just been recently written that's an eye-opening examination of the pathology that's really swept the country. And tonight I want to I want us to maybe just uh as we we've been studying the book of Psalms how much God is wants us to focus on him and what what's happening with what God is, has in his eternal plan. But this book uh deals with uh the whole issue of fear. Now I, most of you may say that I don't have any real big fears, but maybe some of you do. All of us, I think, at some point have fears. And this book particularly deals with different, uh, how people use and, and uh, use different fears to manipulate people to buy their product or to deal with this and that and so forth. And, uh, and it winds up being something where there's money behind it and people do things and make things happen to create fear in our society. Now, <clears throat> fear is something that, in a sense, can be good because it can protect you if you're, if you're in a place where you need to be very cautious. It kind of get, guides us in that realm. But generally speaking, tonight, the fear uh, is what is, is driving uh, multitudes of people tonight. The pharmaceutical industry is just overwhelmed with it. That's why they, they make so much money by selling things. Uh, medications and such that help pe people overcome their fears. But tonight, you know, in, in God's economy, that should not be our our focus. We should immediately be able to uh, turn and, and look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and be able to understand that he has, has handled that fear. I like this in 1 John 4, verses... Uh, 16 and 8 through 18, it says, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love uh, perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love ca uh, casts out fear. For fear has to do with uh, punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Now, the thing tonight is this. Uh, Joshua, who was uh, finally at the end of his uh, journey in life, he had led the Israelites into, Israel, into the promised land. They'd gone through an unbelievable time. He'd taken over after uh, uh, Moses had died. And if you remember, that uh, everything that ha had been promised, uh, Israel was expecting. And so God, uh, through uh, Joshua, makes this tremendous statement. And he says this. He says, and, and now I am about to go to the way of all the earth. And this is in Joshua 23, 14. And you know you're in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. That's, isn't that wonderful? Now, let me, let's, say, let's face it. Israel faced some incredible obstacles, unbelievable things they went through. It was not an easy journey for 40 years in the wilderness. It was, not, it was not an easy thing that they had to go through, but you know what? Every promise that God had made came to pass. Now tonight, <clears throat> we're not Israel, but we certainly inherited the same uh, promises that Israel was given. That's why when God made the promise to Abraham, he said to you and all the your, your descendants will be as the stars of the heavens and as the sands of the sea. Well, you look at Israel and its history, it's just one of the smallest nations that ever was. 
So it included more than just that. It meant those by faith that had trusted God. Now tonight, I just want to encourage you, that's all. I just think we're in a day and age where literally, if you listen to the news at all, if you read the newspapers, if you, if you discuss with people, if you talk to them on the streets, it's nothing but unbelievable turmoil and uncertainty and fear about what is going to happen to us. Is it my money? Is it my home, my job, whatever? All these things happen. Uh, uh, the unbelievable records of things that are going on with t children, young girls being raped, and, and all kinds of things happening, young boys being placed in, in parochial schools and different uh, institutions and so forth. And you say, wow, what is going to happen? Let, let me say this tonight very confidently. The devil is in defeat. He was defeated at Calvary, and the progression of what he's got going on is only going to come to an end. I love this passage in Revelation 12, verses 9 and 10. It says, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and the angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of the Christ have come. To the accuser of our brothers have been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our Lord. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of the testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. You know, in Ezekiel, I mean, Isaiah, excuse me, Ezekiel does it also, but in, in Isaiah 14, has a very interesting picture of what the devil looks like tonight. You know, we think he's very powerful in all these things that he influences and so forth, and we want to respect that. But we also want to know that God has, has, has kind of, the devil always does things. You know, you know what, what, it's interesting that uh, you hear some people claim different things, and they always kind of deceive you. They may, they may lie and they'll swear up and down. They're telling you the truth. And they'll come across as being the truth. And all along, if you find out what they're saying, the source of it, you wind up seeing that it wasn't true after all what they were saying. Well, you know, the devil has made himself out to be far bigger than he really is. And we find in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 16 through 21, it says, Some one day coming soon. It says, and those who see you will stare at you and, and, and ponder over you and say this, is this the man who made the earth tremble, who shook kingdoms, who made the world like a desert and overthrew its cities, who did not let his prisoners go home? And all the kings, kings of the nations lie in glory, each in his own tomb, but you are cast out away from your grave, like a loathed branch, clothed with, slain, closed with the slain, those pierced by the sword, who go down to the stones of the pit like a dead body trampled underfoot. You will not be joined with them in, in burial, because you have destroyed your land. You have slain your people. May the offspring of evildoers never more be named. Prepare the slaughter for his sons because of the guilt of their fathers, lest they rise and possess the earth and fill the face of the earth with, with, their, with the cities. The point is God's saying, listen, it's going, to be, it's going to be quite shocking. If we could pull back the, the veil of the, of the curtain that we can't see. You see, God is here tonight. Wonderfully, the beautiful songs and our worship and just hear the expectation to hear from God. And we have an anointing of hearing, an anointing of, of speaking and, and everything that's happening. And God, we cannot touch him. We can't really see him. But he's promised one day we'll see him in heaven. He's a spirit, that's why. But the devil is a simple spirit too. But one day he'll be seen also cast into the lake of fire that burns forever and ever. And everything that's done, it'll be so minuscule to God. He's just, we're just going to take care of him. He's going to be gone. So now, don't be occupied with what he makes out to be the big thing in our lives, what he's doing in the world, 
how he's moving the nations. They all follow after him, and they you think, and and people follow the lie, only to come to realize, like Second Corinthians thirteen eight says, you can not, do nothing against the truth, only for the truth. God says the truth will reveal it. <laughs> Just sit back, be confident, rest in me, and know that the truth will be the thing that will come to pass. And you know the truth tonight, Jesus said, and the truth will make you free. Amen. Now, therefore tonight, I just want to say, give you a few things. Back many years ago as a young pastor, I, I was very, uh, I get depressed, I get discouraged, I get fearful and so forth. And then a preacher taught me several things about what the Bible says about it. And I thought this was real practical, but it's really kind of helpful tonight. You see, uh, uh, God's amazing care for his own is really, really amazing because this is what this, this preacher told me. In Psalm 37, 24, he says, Though he fall, he shall not utterly be cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And I thought, wow, with his hand. So God, in the Spirit, is holding me up with his hand. Now, now that's that just kind of beginning to get a little, little thought there. Uh, John 10, 28, and it says, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. So God's got me in his hand, and nobody, he says nobody's going to snatch them out of my hand. I don't know about you. That's kind of comforting. You know, it's, uh, what, what am I fearing? The fear seems to go now. Now you say, well, but I can't see him. Well, God says, listen, this is the great test that helps you grow so that you understand no matter what's happening, if you have a good day and we're worshiping and we're having a great time and we feel really secure and we say, yeah, God's hand's under me. The next day, if I'm not, uh, if things are going pretty rough and I'm experiencing a lot of things that cause fear in my life, and I say, where'd God go? Uh, he didn't go. He's still there. So, here's a, some wonderful things of this. It says, and we find here that underneath are the everlasting arms of God. Deuteronomy 33, 27. This preacher told me, this, this ministered to me so special. It says, the eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs> then in Psalm 16, verse 8. God gets, gets a little more thorough, the preacher told me. He says, uh, uh, he says I ha I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. So if I turn this way, there he is at my right hand. And then he, uh, this preacher went on. He said this. He said in, in Job 23, verse 9, which is the story of Job. And Job was really struggling with God with the very thing we're talking about tonight because he didn't know what was going on. And it says, and on the left hand, where, when he is working, he's there. I can't behold him, but he's there. On the left hand, he's working. So let's see. Underneath, he's got his hand, and then the everlasting arms. And then on the right hand, he's there. And on the left hand, he's working. That's pretty comforting to know tonight. If I believe God, and, and, and I think we believe God, Amen. we're working at that, right? <laughs> and, and so we find that it says, and then it's, we find it, that Song of Solomon is very special because it's talking about uh, the relationship of, of Christ with his church. And, and remember the Shulamite woman kind of represents the church. And uh, the, the, the lover, uh, Solomon, was represented Christ. And it says here that in uh, Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 6, it says this, And his left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. Okay, let's get the picture. Hand under me, God's in my hand. Then I got the right, the arms under me also. Then on the right hand he's working. On the left hand he's working. And now we've got him under my. He's he's he actually got his arm around me, and he's he's embracing me, and he's holding me in his hands. You may say well, this is kind of foolish tonight, but you know what? The reality tonight is this: if I don't get a grasp of who God is in my life, then I'll easily fall prey to the kind of fear and things that the devil wants to deceive us and get us sidetracked. Because these are real, my friends. 
if we could even if we could pull back the curtain and see how many times God had his hand on us and what he was doing to work for us, we would be shocked. We say, well, and God will just say, well, well didn't I tell you so? Didn't I, didn't I, wasn't I specific enough? Now, we find here this wonderful psalm. My, my wife and I have been looking at this and reading this a number of times in Psalm 37, uh, 24. And, and this, uh, Pastor Kelly's been going through these, the psalms and he touched on this. He says, and when he falls, he will not be thrown down head first because the Lord holds on his hand. And he is behind me and speaks to me and he guides me because it says that in, in your ear sh shall hear a word from behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. Now you see, if I'm in tune with God and I'm, th feel and I'm obeying him tonight, God says, you know what? I'm right there. If you seek me, I, I will give you direction." Simon and I were talking today about, you know, the, the, the issue of literally having God uh, give us specific direction in how we go and what we say, you know. And, and if you seek God, I was talking to a man this morning, and he, he's had gone through unbelievable hellish thing. I mean, it's terrible, a lot, a lot like a lot of people. And he said, I, I prayed, and, and I asked God, and I said, God, please, I just need direction. He says, so I went to the Word, and I usually am studying in this vein of passages, like one chapter after another, and I just said, God says, no, just, just, just start looking in the Word today. Let me show you something. And he said, you know what? God gave him three specific things, and he said, like a, like a flood, it peacefully filled my heart, and all of a sudden, the fear was gone. I says, did he speak to you? He said, he sure did. Yeah, that, isn't that wonderful tonight? You know, I I've talked to so many people in the plane and and uh, in the in the at the at the gas stations and the different stores and stuff. Just try to try, start up a conversation. They are so fearful. They have nothing to go to. They don't understand there any provision whatsoever. But God says, I'm going to take care of it. Now, quickly, in First Kings, I'll I'll draw this to conclusion here quickly here, but. Uh, you know, the, the, in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 14, let's, let me quickly set the stage. Uh, Elijah's on Mount Carmel in chapter 18, calling down fire from heaven. All of Israel watching. Unbelievable demonstration of the power of God. The guys are cutting themselves of the, uh, of the priests of Baal, and they're doing everything they can to try to make... And, and, and I, Elijah's standing back and mocking him and says, maybe he's asleep. Why don't you scream a little louder? And, and maybe he'll wake up and he'll come down and do what you ask him. And, you know, they had nothing happened. And then, then Elijah puts the water on the, on the altar and barrels of water and barrels of water. And because, remember, it had a famine for three years. It was a little dry. And he brought all this water in and put it on there. He called down fire from heaven. God came down, licked up the water, licked up the, the offering, licked up the stones, licked up the water out of the thing. I mean, just completely did everything that's, that uh, Elijah asked. Then Elijah winds up the next end of the chapter, hadn't rained for three years, and God, he cries out to God. He says, now, God, please bring it. And the man went out, remember, went, kept going back and out. Go check again. And then there was a, a cloud the size of a man's fist. And he says, go tell Ahab that rain is coming and it's going to be pouring. And it did. And then a little Elijah, God bless him, he's a great king. He's done all these wonderful things. In the next chapter, verse, chapter 19, all of a sudden Jezebel sends him a little note. It says, if I catch you, the same prophets you just killed, I'm going to kill you just like them. And he runs. 150 miles. If you look on the map from where he was and where he winds up, 150 miles, and then he puts a decoy and he goes into the wilderness, a day's journey in the wilderness and hides. 
And then he's crying out. He says, God, oh, he says, he says here in verse, uh, in verse 14, he probably says, I have been zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Now, anybody that cry out to God like that, you know, okay, God supposedly has to speak. Here was the prophet. <laughs> and God says, oh, uh, I got some things I want to get, want you to do. But God, I'm talking to you. I got all these problems. God gives him literally seven things to do. It's unbelievable. Just says, well, no, this is what you wanted to do, Elijah. But, but God, I'm out of business. I'm through. I quit. No, 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 Elijah, I want you to do it. Okay? So he tells him, he says, go back to the same way you came. Go running back the way you came. You ran all this distance. Go back where you came. Number two, travel in the wilderness of Damascus. There anoint Hezael, the king of Aram. Anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king of Israel. Anoint Elisha, son of Zephath, to replace you, my prophet. Whoever escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehu. Whoever escapes from Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Elijah's saying, wait a minute, you're missing it, God. I'm not going to do any of that. Then God says, oh, by the way, you, 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 you were complaining about what I said. I, let, me, let me tell you. I still have 7,000 in Israel that have not bowed their knees to Baal, that love me. They need leadership. So basically, Elijah, just be quiet and rest in me. I haven't finished using you. See, some people just, you know, they want to crawl under the, the table and bury their head in the pillow and they want to take on drugs and all kinds of stuff to calm down their nerves and stuff. And God says, wait a minute. <laughs> Don't get sidetracked. I got things for you to do. Let's, let's keep moving on. The time hasn't come. Jesus hasn't, the trumpet hasn't sound yet. We haven't been caught up yet. There's things to do. I don't care if the whole world falls apart. What are you fearing that happening? If it happens, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Why are you worried about that? You're fearing things. It's stupid. Just wasting your time. It's distracting you from what I have in store to finish with people's lives. You know, we're going to go into this building over here very soon. I am just overwhelmed at the miracle here. I mean, you've been like Israel, wandering all over St. Petersburg. I mean, let's face it, I mean, what, 5, 10, 25, I don't know how many places. It's just unbelievable. I mean, I remember way back in Clearwater, we, there was family there, the Epperson uh, Gary Epperson remembers that. They had a Bible study in Clearwater back in 75, 76. And uh, here we are. God's going to do it. Now, you know what? God says, I, I've, got, I've got a lot to do in this community here. And I got you where I want you. You're not just uh, brand new believers. You're seasoned. You've been through a lot of different things. So there's nothing to fear. If there was anything to fear along the way, there's a lot of things to fear. Didn't know where we were going to be, didn't know this, you had families, this and that, all kinds of stuff. But I need you to be like Elijah and just trust me, I have things to do. I, you know, maybe before Jesus returns, I, I think it would just bless us all. We may see many, many, many people. I, I, I don't want to make any prophecy prediction, I'm not into that. But who knows? If we keep our focus on Jesus Christ and the promises of he's got his hand under us, he's got his arms under us, he's got on the right hand, he's on the left hand, he's behind us, he'll speak to us if we ask him. I mean, unbelievable what could happen. And we've kind of learned some of those things already. Now, in conclusion tonight, it, there was a, uh, maybe I've told this story before, but I'm going to bore you with it again, but... Uh, I learned a lesson as a boy. Uh, we had this, uh, my neighborhood in Yarmouth, Maine, was filled with dogs. Everybody and his third cousin had a dog or maybe even five or six of them. The only one that didn't have it was my family. My father didn't want one, so we had a cat. What a, <laughs> a wicked trade-off there, but anyway. But the next-door neighbor 
had this big old slobbering St. Bernard. You know them things, they just, every time they shake their head, get, look out, it's coming. <laughs> Slobber and spit everywhere. Gentle old thing, he'd come up wagging his tail and he'd pat him and he'd just slobber all over you. Big old huge thing. It's like, you know, it'd stand about this high, okay? And then, the, you know, all the dogs in the neighborhood kind of respected him. They didn't give him a lot of trouble. But there was this one little dog. And his, he was, uh, it was kind of pathetic. Uh, somehow in an accident, he'd, he'd lost a leg, so he had three legs. Uh, somebody had poked his eye out, so he had one eye. Some other dog had, in a fight, had bit off his tail. And then they didn't want him to be, you know, in the place of having little dogs, so they castrated him. So here he is, and, and you know what his name was? Lucky. Yeah, see? Now, I know, some of you say, no, that's not, yeah, that is. That's exactly what this dog's name was. We called him Lucky. And, you know, this dog was everybody, every dog in the neighborhood would go after him. Hey, chase him, bite him, do everything under the sun. So for some reason, he winds up becoming friends to the St. Bernard. Now, the St. Bernard could have taken in one bite, and that would have been the end of him. He'd have eaten him. But the St. Bernard kind of took compassion. I, I'm watching this as a child. I'm saying, what in the world? You know, and, and so they'd be walking down the street, and this little dog, he'd, just be, he'd be chewing on his ear, hanging on his ear. He'd try to trip him up. And, you know, the big St. Bernard, St. Bernard, just, just patient and kind and everything. But woe unto the dog that decided to attack the little dog. That St. Bernard became one ferocious animal. And would attack him and run him all, and do everything under the sun. So the little, little tiny Lucky, the dog, winds up having this unbelievable heritage. He can go anywhere. Uh, I know St. Bernard here, big my big brother. You know what, tonight, <clears throat> sometimes you and I feel that we maybe don't have anybody that really cares a lot about us. Uh, Jesus Christ tonight is one who loves us and cares for us. We have a big brother, someone who's going to take care of us. And if I fear things that, are, that shouldn't be, uh, Jesus is going to take care of them. He's promised that. So tonight I just think it's important that we recognize that we're not alone in this. This is going to work out right. Uh, if if the whole economy collapses, if people, everything happens, and it's you know all kinds of stuff, you know what? I'm resting in the one who made that promise that jo Joshua said. God has not failed in any one of those promises. Every one of them will come to pass. Now, isn't that an encouragement tonight? I know some of you have lost uh, loved ones here tonight in the past year. I know there's been tragedies, there's been homes that have been broken up, there's been struggles and all kinds of things that have happened, lost your job, all kinds of, but you know what? Jesus knows that. And we still have food to eat, a roof over our head, a provision, because the one in heaven sits at the right hand of God the Father tonight, ever living to make intercession for us. So I, I just pray tonight as we see this and realize that it's not rocket science here. It's just a reality that uh, I have to recognize that even though God is invisible tonight, he's very visible with how he takes care of us. Amen. Father, we ask you bless tonight. Thank you, Father, for how that you love us. Thank you, Father, that uh, David thought himself at times and 1 Samuel 15, verse 17, that he was, he was so little in, in his own eyes. And, and God said, listen, you know, through Samuel, he says, though you may seem little in your own eyes, in God's eyes, you're very important to him. Father, thank you. We're, we're sinners saved by grace, but we are also new creations in Christ, and old things have passed away, all things have become new. And tonight, 
We are more than conquerors, as Romans 8 speaks about. We are more than conquerors. We're not conquering. We are more than conquerors. And therefore, to fear the, the, the things that God has dealt with is, is going to only bring torment, as it said there in 1 First John 4. Fear brings torment. But the love of God, his care for us, his love for us, is what transforms and gives us confidence. And like that little, like little Lucky there, Father, just being able to say, you know what? I know somebody bigger than you. And I, my fears don't, are, are going to be dealt with by that person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. Bless Pastor Kelly tonight. Thank you for the leadership of the church. Thank you for a missionary Sunday coming up. We're going to be on.